I forget how many students. Uh, Arsh and Adeline are hopefully watching this video. Ah, <laughs> uh, programming. So back in the day, so early 1940s, this was how you wrote a program. So in other words, the CPU, uh, it's a circuit. There's a bunch of wires that make things happen. And if you want different things to happen, you just change the wires, right? This is sort of the, I feel like this is actually the kind of obvious way to represent a control system would be to have like, when this thing is done, this wire will go high and then that will start this other thing. And when that thing's done, it will you know, run the wire that makes this other thing happen. And if I want multiple things to happen at once, I just put in a wire splitter and then I fire off two things happening at once. And then I have to somehow make the, so, so uh, have you ever seen ladder logic? This, uh, ring a bell? So uh, industrial control systems are all done with ladder logic, which is a representation of basically a set of relays. I should not try and so. it, it sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> It, uh, it, and, and uh, yeah, so basically, you know, I, I, I would do, uh, I'm super tempted to try this. So if, if, I want, if I want a motor, for example, to turn on if one of two things are true, all I do is I just take the, the relays and I hook them together. I throw them capacitors because they, they have some standard way to draw a relay that looks like a capacitor, and I forget what it is. But uh, so, so basically, if, uh, if this is true, turn the motor on. If this is true, it'll turn the motor on. Uh, and if they're both true, then the motor is definitely on. Yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, how, how do you do it? Uh, if, so, so this is essentially an OR. Uh, if, if I want to do a wired AND, how do I do a wired? So it is the motor should only turn on if both of these things are true, like we're overheated and uh, there's nobody inside the control room. You, you hook up a uh, relay to one of them to the other one mm -hmm. so that... So I, 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 maybe just doing a switch is a better... A less awful yeah. way to, to represent okay. that. So this switch has to close, and that switch has to close before the motor can possibly come on. And, and if either one is open, basically there is, I said they're both relays, mostly yeah. because that way you're not back feeding voltage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so somehow you need the control line to basically yeah. not be connected because oftentimes the like the motor will be like 480 volts or something, and the control line is like 24 volts. So you well, want the motor might be, be two, 240 volts. Yeah, 240. Would be yeah, it'd be a 240 yeah. volt motor, and your control line is, is yeah. either 12 or 24 or 48 volts. All of duckering is three phase two, uh, 480, which which is pretty serious. They have giant plugs, the, the plugs alone in that building. So, uh, so, 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 so again, hardwired control is actually something that's used throughout to this day in at least representing building control systems, and it was uh, so. so uh, Really surprising things. You want to change the program periodically, right? Like we got the set. So I, IBM was pioneering this kind of thing, and you want to use the same machine to do payroll with one control panel, and then you'd like to rewire it to do the accounting, balance the books. But then you got to do payroll again two weeks later, and ideally the same way you did it before. How do you do that? Uh, in that case, is that's where you'd probably have a bus connection. And you like a ribbon, and you just unplug your control cape panel that has been wired for uh, payroll, and you plug in your accounting control board. So here, here, here so th this was IBM's solution, which is beautiful. The control panel is just this chunk of injection molded plastic that just has holes. When you put a programming wire in, it, its plug actually just sticks through the hole, and then. Uh, so, you, 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 so what this means is you can actually set up the program without having the machine, yeah. and then you take the whole set of wires that are you know, crammed on the other side of this thing, and you plug this thing into the, the computer, and then all the wires are all set up at once, which is great. And then you just need to unplug the whole ball of wires. You can stick in a new ball of wires to do you know, the development stuff, to do the you know, so, uh, different functions that you want to do. So, so you actually get, so, so program loading basically means just plugging your employee into control panels, which I presume must have taken a bunch of force, or, or they had some really, it, so you want a reliable contact to plug in. And you don't want it coming unplugged when you, yeah. when you add or remove. Yeah, yeah. Because debugging that would be a huge pain yeah. in the butt. Yeah, so, so th this is one of the reasons why computers were expensive and complicated is because they had to have really you know, mechanically high quality parts to, do yes. to represent the program. Uh, I've seen some of that old stuff. It was definitely oh. robust. 
so, so, so the, uh, <clears throat> you could club someone with a control panel and... Oh, the old IBM keyboard. Yeah. yeah. You could the beat somebody to death with it and it would still work. I, I, my, my favorite story about this is uh, in the boiler shed, uh, which is sort of this like spiders and uh, coal ash uh, on, in my property. We, we, were, we were cleaning out because it was, it could have been used as storage. There's a bunch of random stuff like old cardboard boxes. And uh, buried in the, the coal shed, in, in the ground, under the ground, was a phone. And with this ancient green, you know, AT&T phone. And we think like, we kind of need an extra phone. I wonder if it works. Like it's literally been buried in coal ash for, I don't know how many, and it's, it's actually quite possible it was not from uh, the people that built our house, which was only a few years before we moved in, but the cabin had been there since the 70s, because it actually really looked like a 70s phone. And, uh, and, and had been, the, the, the yes. cabin like it had burned down or something, had been still like plowed into the, uh, so, so it's It'll a really old phone. It, it worked, we plugged it in, dial tone, and we're like, makes calls? Sure, cool. We've been using that phone since, uh, for the past decade. Yeah. It's, it's sort of our deep, because it's actually kind of hard to find like a hardwired phone anymore. Because <laughs> AT&T you, don't crap too last. And you, you can't good. find, uh, well that was one of the things is they the, warrantied yeah, those no. phones, so if it broke, it was at mm. their expense to fix it. Interesting. So they wanted him to, they, you know, they wanted you to keep paying for it. So mechanical robustness, reliability, very important for this sort of thing, especially for payroll, right? Like if, if you lose a digit on payroll, like, uh, oops, we paid everybody. I mean, it's it's really bad to either have paid people 10 times too much or one tenth as much. Like both of those cause you big problems. Yes. So uh, th these these things are really expensive. Uh, what what so, so operationally, if this is your way of changing programs, what uh, what is that uh, what does that cost you? Well, for one, it, it's it's labor intensive mm -hmm. because you have so to have somebody, somebody has to who, physically remove parts from the computer. To somebody has to sit there and physically remove. Yeah. It's also yeah. hard to uh, program uh, logically because you have to actually sit down with basically paper and pen or <laughs> marker or something, and you have to. Uh, Figure out the connect, all the connections. So imagine and it's hard building, to debug yeah. too. Imagine building a compiler for this. Because you could literally have to be yeah. debugging it because <laughs> it may have bugs. It might might have actual insects in it. <laughs> Can you build a compiler for this system? No. Well, you could with today's technology. Like a three D printer that extrudes wires. That, that's what I was actually thinking about the like, like automated like the, wire wrap? like the yeah. '80s robot thing. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so the weird part about this is that actually th this was this was considered okay enough that this was actually pretty common. Like, so, so th this was a control panel they, they called it, and uh, and it's because the wires in the control panel controlled the different parts of the machine. And it, it is there there when when you have uh, lugs, uh, you know, like. AC system installers and stuff. Some sometimes stuff like this actually makes more sense to those types. So, the, 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 I guess there are advantages here. Like uh, I can I can use a multimeter and I can debug yeah. like the actual internals of the machine with the same interface I use for programming stuff. Ah, uh, the, the 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 big downside is switching program means pulling physically pulling stuff off of the machine, which actually runs the you know increases the uh, wear on the contacts, etc. How else do you do it? Hmm. Change programming? Yeah, yeah. so, so. Uh, you, can ch you can also change the computer. Keep the same front. <laughs> just change the components on the back end. Swap, swap the back end out. Swap the back end ah, out. So, 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 let's see. Oh, dip switches, too. Uh, Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so switches. Yeah. No, the problem with switches is they don't actually keep the state. So switching programs is expensive. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The. So the, 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 there was a whole a whole generation, and uh, this is not it's not it. So the the, uh, the the reason we call a loop a loop is because uh, so so somewhere you'd have a control uh, uh, punch card. So basically, this, what this was doing was making electrical contacts through the hole. Uh, like often it'd be a pin or something to sit through there. So it, it, so it had a control card that would tell the machine to do one step in it. 
and then it would advance to the next card so I could have just a whole row of cards. And if I wanted, to keep, I wanted the machine to keep doing the same thing over and over again, I could literally just take the card, set of cards into a loop. So they, they feed out of the machine, and we'll go back and feed back into the machine, and then get the, 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 the thing keeps on moving. And then if I, uh, if I want to change the program, I might actually have to cut into the loop and then patch in a uh, new set of cards to make new things happen. Really right? and, and in fact, rejects. our terms loop and bug and patch all sort of date from this era, yeah. uh, which is kind of surprising. Now, uh, uh, a loop is actually quite straightforward to implement with punched cards. What if I want nested loops? That gets complicated, and you might need something like multiple uh, card readers. Where you have one card reader that you have is an outer loop and then an inner loop. Yeah, and, and, and what happens is when the proper instruction comes up and on the outer loop, it executes the inner loop. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Ah, so the punch cards are totally thing. Actually, so, so this, you know, the, the control panel, as far as I could tell, was like 40s, like hardwired technology. The, the, you know, sort of the, the, they started building sort of big computers in about the 40s, the, the, the 30s and 40s. So, so hardwired control unit. Uh, and, and uh, pluggable boards of these things. But it, apparently, so, so programming was considered sort of like a switchboard or electrician kind of task, like you would yeah. be making electrical contacts. It was a great leap when von Neumann kind of came up with a, a sort of popularized this idea in a tech report basically saying like, hey, we should actually just have, st I mean, the machine has to store data anyway. We should have it store programs. And uh, uh, it, it could store programs in the same memory where it stores data. That is that, that is a big leap. What's so upsides and downsides of this? Um, upside is you can start abstracting more. Uh, you, you're you're more flexible. You know, you, your program can be as large as your memory almost. You know, you you, you could strike whatever balance between program and. Uh, data as you, you needed, you know, back when RAM was still really expensive, though the price had dropped. Or the downside, uh, what we're seeing right now, of course, is security in that uh, your program and your, your data can become uh, corrupt each other. You know, if your program, if, 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 if your programming was in separate memory than your data, your data could never break into the programming memory yep. and, and, and cause the issues there, so it would be more secure. But on the other hand, if you have a mega program and, and a mega data, you know, you can't, you wouldn't be able to say, okay, I only have a quarter meg of data, but I need, you know, more than a meg of programming to, to process it. I think this one, the Arduino, has like 2K of RAM, but it's got 256K of flash. I've had situations where I've got, still got plenty of flash space, but I need more RAM. Yeah. So then you figure out how to move like strings and things out of RAM and into flash. It's definitely uh, so, 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 so segregated memory. Uh, so w w what does a program loader look like? Jacob. So I'm, I'm running one program and I want to run a different program. How do you do it if everything is slammed into the same memory? Well, uh, register. Oh, register. Mm -hmm. Pointer. <laughs> well, okay. So here, 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 here's the situation. I've got. Uh, so here, here's my RAM. And uh, here, here I have the old code. In, in, the, in, in the CPU, you have a pointer. Uh, you have a register that contains the uh, a pointer to the next uh, code mm -hmm. to execute, and you simply overwrite that pointer so with the spot mm -hmm. for the new code. So, so, so the, 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 there's a program counter that says where we're running stuff. And, and the way stuff normally works, the program counter just runs this, this instruction, moves forward, runs the next instruction, moves forward, runs the next instruction, hit a loop or something, moves back, runs more instructions. Uh, so, so, so the question is, if, if, if somewhere, say, on disk, I've got the new code, Especially if I've, uh, you know, I, I have the ability to read stuff from disk because I need to like, I, and I've been reading and writing data. So here, here's like the data that I've been using. And uh, if, if I want to load a new program, it's sitting on disk. Like what, what's, what's the difference between loading a bunch of data off disk and loading a new program off disk? Yeah. 
guess we can take a look at the difference with wood. It just looks like on there, but it might be. But there isn't really any difference, right? They're like the, you know, the, 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 the program executable code is just numbers. Absolutely. The data I was loading was just numbers. So, so the, the great part is, like if I've got a, a you know, function that loads me data, I can do the same function to load code, and it's going to load into memory somewhere. And it, yeah, again, I just point the program counter at the new, so load the new code into RAM somewhere. Yeah, I was just thinking, because I was just, if it is just numbers, just zero and ones, it wouldn't yeah. be any different than just the same shape of pipe at the time. Yeah. If you wanted to be that. Now, th th there is actually one complication with this that, uh, uh, where does the code to load the code come from? Uh, bootstrap program. In that when you first get totally, out, totally depends. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, it depends on how you design the system. But one one option would be is you have a bit of uh, uh, non-volatile RAM. I remember mm -hmm. this back in the DOS days. Is that you had you uh, a lot of the lowest part of the RAM addresses yeah. was for hardware, and so what you could have it set up is your 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 bootloader would be a non-volatile ROM at memory address say zero. Yeah. And and that would start up, and that would just run a, a program that's in ROM uh, that would load up code in a standard area, and and in fact, they often the, like the modern modern way to run machines, you build some sort of non-volatile storage somewhere. It originally, it was ROM it was like a hardwired uh, setup, or it actually apparently there were machines where uh, they want to save money. There's no ROM. Instead, they have a row of switches in the front, and you enter the machine code to load the boot block by hand. Well, it's a part lot of the of manual. Just options. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is so if you didn't buy the optional boot ROM, then every time you booted the machine, you'd have to load up the loader, <laughs> and then the loader would be stored on disk. Well, and then, then once then once you load the loader, then then if it, as long as the loader doesn't uh, overwrite itself, then it can load in lots of new programs. Most of the time, the switches though were were, were more for for boot options mm -hmm. than or debug or, or de yeah, for debugging yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Um, you had like master slave for uh, hard drives, um, bad but terminology. But yeah. So, so <laughs> the, you had boot options in the, for, with the switches. The ROM loaded. Uh, I remember that there were ones where you used. I think it was ultraviolet light. You actually had a sticker on the chip for your for your your bootloader that if you took the sticker off and shined a special light at it, it would erase it and you could reprogram it. UV but, erasable EEPROM, yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, so some sort of storage is not going to get overwritten, and particularly it's not going to just go away if you lose power. Yeah, it, 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 it just needs to be non volatile. But uh, oh, I remember my dad upgrading the ROM on a computer once by literally pulling the chip out and putting that. a new chip that he had been yeah. mailed yeah. in. They, they, they don't do that very much anymore. <laughs> No, they don't do it. You know, Flash is so much cheaper now. One of my first jobs was uh, uh, adding cache memory to a, it was a 46 or something, and the motherboard shipped with uh, sockets for cache memory to go in, but yeah. no cache memory. <laughs> so you, you'd buy the chips separately and then plug them in. And of course, this being the first job I'm doing, I'm on somebody's kitchen table, like, plugging these chips in, and one of the pins bends backward. Ooh. And I think, like, okay, very gingerly remove the, 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 the chip. Very carefully, like re you know, bend the pin back so it's going to make contact. Plug it in, and then this time the pin breaks off. I was just going to say like, that's, that's perfectly bad. fine. I brought my soldering iron, <laughs> so I'm literally soldering the wires. Are going to be like attaching this person's cache memory, and it actually booted. And as far as I can tell, it uh, uh, worked worked until the machine became obsolete. So that's all we can hope. Six for. months later, yeah. well, I never I never got you know in, in a small town like Glen Allen, you got called back. And everyone would know that you had failed somehow. <laughs> uh, so let's see. So 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 uh, so lots of crazy stuff becomes possible, right? Like this this multi-phase boot process, right? I, I have a little tiny bit of stuff that's like in a hard-coded location on disk that lets me load the, the you know the rest of the stuff and lets me load variable stuff. I can suddenly build operating systems. I can suddenly build like a, a compilers because a compiler is this new chunk, uh, an old chunk of code that writes the new chunk of code at runtime, creates it. I, in fact, I, in fact sort of to me, von Neumann uh, deserves more credit for kind of starting what we think of as computing. Like, because this tower of abstraction we've been building for the last 70 years, kind of, it kind of starts with this notion of 
what, what if the program was not a ball of wires, but it was just data, like all the other data were processing in the machine already, right? That this, this is a, a, a surprisingly powerful technique. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's powerful. It's like the dark side of the force. <laughs> like the force. <laughs> the, 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 there are certainly problems. So, so uh, uh, you, you brought up the security problem. Actually, I've totally had this happen several times. I'm writing code on a you know von Neumann style machine, like all of our machines, and uh, basically here's my little array, and here's the OS. And uh, if I run off the end of my array, I trash parts of the OS. And uh, so to machines without protected memory, so this is the DOS, uh, the, the uh, pre Mac OS 10 Mac OS. <laughs> there, there was no protected memory. It was basically just your stuff and the OS and the you know. But actually, there was a ROM that you couldn't break, which was kind of handy. So it's it's the, part, parts of the OS lived in ROM, which was, was which nice. is they why were rebooting safer. was was a lot of times. You could answer. always reboot, and you didn't have to like re you know build the machine from scratch or yeah. order a new computer. <laughs> Not required. Uh, but but I I thought it were accidental. I've overwritten parts of the OS, and and you hope that you know it's not an important part. But fairly often it was like you know I, I sort of and this this was really good training for getting your array indexing correct and guaranteed to yes. be correct because if you screwed up you had to reboot. Well, and that's that, where that's where you you know you having a lot of times the OS was because it was also the first loaded it was in the mm -hmm. higher parts of me memory. Mm -hmm. So at least theoretically, most of the time when you screwed up an index, you went over. Ah, Mac OS was really it had a very weird memory management. It, it, it was literally moving things around in RAM to so, so, uh, the big big problem with uh, a lot of operating systems is fragmentation. You got a lot of RAM fragmentation doesn't really matter. Like if I've got so it, at the time, I had 128 kilobytes of RAM, right? That was the first Mac OS. And uh, the, the problem is, you, you'd have, uh, you know, you, you load in a program, the program takes up some space, it allocates some stuff, it deallocates some space. You know, I don't have a whole lot of spare space to like say, well, you know, you allocated some things and then threw some things away. So these little slots and places where you threw things away were unusable. Instead, the Mac OS would actually compact RAM, it would mem copy stuff down, it would move your pointers, which is really, and uh, it, normally, in fact, you kept a pointer to an operating system array of pointers that it would update if it decided to move everything around, which it could do at sort of the drop of the hat. Uh, but there are lots of weird problems uh, that came, came out of doing that. So, so, so oftentimes it ended up the OS stuff was just mixed in with your stuff, and it was it, uh, as long as everybody did everything perfectly every time, it worked great. But if you know, it was very easy to accidentally break uh, to, uh, break parts of the machine. Ah, uh, let's see. Oh, th th this and uh, this reminds me of the uh, uh, witch encoding. I I, uh, I forgot about uh, uh, describing because I knew there was one row is missing the little table down there. Ah, uh, there's some really crazy wacky mathematics that completely relies on transforming like a proof. If I turn a proof into a number then I can actually feed a proof's number back into the proof itself. And I can get self-reference, so that's going to do really bizarre things, like uh, I can implement, rigorously implement the liar paradox, for example. This sentence is false. Uh, the, the, the this part ending up saying, like, well, if this sentence is false, and it says it's false, that sentence must be true. But if it's true, the sentence says it's false. So, uh-oh. Right. And then you end up with, <laughs> with, with the Star Trek thing and, and the uh, Android's brain explodes. Uh, any computer whose brain explodes in like first order self-reference, uh, uh, like in like self-reference and negation doesn't, they, they, they don't deserve to rule humanity. Uh, and in, in particular, uh, th there's a whole lot of proofs that basically rely on saying like, what you want is the stable state of this circuit. Right? Yeah. <laughs> An inverter whose output feeds into its own input has no stable state, right? Like, if it's true, then it's false. And it's false, yeah. and it's true, and it's true. There's no stable state. It doesn't have a stable state. It doesn't exist. So, there was a completeness theorem that says, like, there are statements that have no proof but are true, because uh, there are statements that, con that contradict their own existence. Uh, and uh, the Turing halting problem is actually exactly the same trick that I, I actually. So, so uh, in, in both cases, I need to feed the thing itself back into the thing. And that, that's a really weird. Uh, version of self-reference. The way you make that rigorous is by encoding the, the proof as a number, encoding the Turing machine as a number, and then having and then feeding that number back into any other Turing machine, including the original Turing machine, which is how you get the self-reference back. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see the gory details on that. 
Uh, it's, it, this is something actually lots and lots of scripting languages have discovered. So for example, I, uh, I'm writing Python. And to run a line of Python, I got to work my way through the cares and count the indentation to figure out where it's at, and then make sure you know, to figure, to parse the, the cares to figure out what the, what the line is actually trying to tell me to do. Parsing is expensive. If I've got a loop in an interpreter, I kind of, I mean, the natural way to do this is I have to reparse every line every time I run it, which works, it's just crazy slow. So a much more efficient way to do it is take the whole program and convert it all into bytecode or some sort of like numeric pre-parsed version of the code. And uh, so, so, so uh, uh, Java uh, was kind of the first, uh, the first one to really popularize this. So Java has bytecode that represents the compiled version of your Java uh, code. And, uh, and, and then you can build an interpreter for bytecode really cheaply. Uh, we'll, we'll see how to do interpreters, maybe today. Gosh, time flies. Ah, so, so table-driven programming, or, uh, I love table-driven programming, one of my favorite techniques. Uh, so so table-driven programming, uh, where basically you know you're going to need to solve problem X, I'm going to need to do steps A, B, C, D, E. Okay, great. I make a table that just says X, A, B, C, D, E. Y, A, C, D, E, F, right? Z, so, so basically you know, the steps I need to do to solve each of these problems. And then, and then the code ends up being super simple, which just basically says like, which problem is this? Okay, here's how I'm gonna solve it, boom, 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 boom. And uh, makes, makes for, and, and the cool part about this is very easy to extend those. So the, the program can change its table, for example, or, or you, can, you, know, you can figure out how to change the table. Uh, lots of stuff gets a lot easier. Uh, so, so we talked about program loading and copying. I mean, the, the notion that I can copy program by just copying the numbers, I mean, that's, that's actually super powerful. I can't copy the plug board. If I want to do a dev version of the plug board, right? Like I've got, you actually I've have got the in, plug board. You have to get another board. plug board and have an intern copy it over. <laughs> yeah, manually. Oh my God. Like, <laughs> this is like the yellow. So, so you have to have an intern going through and going, okay. You have to trace each one. Now remember, yeah. if you get this wrong, not only will your paycheck not come out right, no one's paycheck will come out right. And, and, and you will and be fired before the company goes back. And either that or you have uh, some sort of like, a, maybe you have a paper. Um, mm, specs. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's the 40s, yeah. Some, some horn and glasses guy with a pipe It's going to be like, yes, we can do this. Uh, well, but even back then, what you need to get interns to do it. Mm. Ah, you, you can copy yourself by copying your numbers, right? So, so it not only can a loader load a program, but a, a program can copy its own self somewhere. So that's the classic sort of virus thing. I, actually, if, if, uh, if you've never seen the disassembly of the Sapphire one, it's, it's like, it's under 400 bytes that work as a UDP packet, uh, that work as a sort of SQL request, and then the, the, uh, the it, it, it buffer overflows something in a SQL server that makes uh, the SQL server start spamming the world with copies of that one little package. It, uh, it, it is, I think to this day, the fastest propagating worm that has ever existed. Because basically like one packet flings out there on the internet onto a vulnerable SQL server. That SQL server, which, and SQL servers are usually like beefy machines with big network connections, right? They're, yes. they're database servers. So th this database server gets hit by this thing and it's this tiny little UDP packet and it just starts spamming the entire internet with these little UDP packets. And then any, any SQL server that it hits is going to instantly start spamming the internet with those, those, uh, those things. It, it, uh, it infected basically all the infectable hosts in seven minutes worldwide. <laughs> uh, it's, it's sort of an incredible, because uh, it, it's just this time, it basically is a random number generator and they send this to everybody. <laughs> it was, it remind, that reminds me of the Melissa virus um, I, I found out about the Melissa virus is when I got a call telling me somebody is sending porn over Autodin. And the thing about that was, is Autodin was originally a teletype system. So my response was somebody just found a way to extend the, the lifespan of Autodin by 20 years. Because it was originally, because it was not capable of sending graphics. graphics. Uh, we're talking lowercase letters was a new feature. Okay, so it was hilarious, but what happened was is their machine was actually infected with it and it looked like it had come from us, but yeah. <laughs>
So uh, I can copy myself and reproduce myself across the internet, for example. So that's yeah. the worms, uh, the viruses would be a tool thing tech on the end of an EXE that just tacks itself onto the end of other EXEs. And it, uh, I mean, that's it. so, so for, for something to self-propagate properly, it needs to be able to you know, have access to its own code. And the obvious place to do that is just find, to use the program counter as a data counter. Yeah. Right? And then read, yeah, read, read itself. So you, you can actually, so, uh, they don't let you do this anymore, but back in the day, you could really easily just, uh, the program is running along and it says, I have finished starting up. The next time I jump to the spot, I want to just skip over all the startup code. Uh, and uh, the easy way to do it is just, uh, instead of the startup code, you just overwrite the jump to the end of the startup code. And then when you jump to, into, into your function, it will just skip the startup code the next time around. And uh, so, so, so self-modifying code, and, and there are, uh, Right, the, the Linux kernel literally does this. It, it starts up, it looks at the CPU it's got. If the CPU has, for example, SSE, it'll uh, use the SSE uh, extension. If it doesn't have SSE, then it'll, it'll swap those out right, and, and can, can modify its own code. At, at, now it, it usually it's only done at load time, but uh, I, I've seen... Uh, protected is, mode for CPUs. Is it starts up in mm -hmm. unprotected mode, and, and there's a command to, to tell it to, yeah. to, to go yeah. to protected mode, yeah. so it does its startup things flips it into protected mode and then starts yeah. up the other operating system. And I, I, I forget the core details of this, but like uh, shared libraries, the core details of loading a shared library are fairly expensive. So it actually does it lazily. When I, when I call a function of a shared library, the call actually goes to a chunk a chunk of code that does nothing but load a shared library. It doesn't call it yet. But to, to avoid having to go through that every time you call it, then uh, the last thing it does after it's loaded it is it overwrites the place where the, the, the global offset table and it overwrites the global offset table with a pointer to straight to the actual loaded library code. So, so the first time you do it, it goes in and loads it and then calls it. And the second time you do it, then it, it, it has just uh, modified its own code to jump straight to where it's supposed to go. So because it's numbers, it can change itself, which is, uh, again, a really powerful technique. Uh, so so uh, John von Neumann, it sort of got his name on that. It said, uh, I mean, Kidel and Turing were sort of talking about self-reference in, in this explicit fashion. Uh, for, for years before, but Von Neumann was at the time where they were actually building the computers. So instead of a plug board, that's, that's uh, a thing they could do. Now, uh, sort, sort of ongoing debate was, do you literally have one chunk of RAM that has the code and the data both fighting it out in there? Because it's really easy, I mean, accidental problems, security problems, uh, th there's actually kind of a bottleneck, like you have, you have, you know, CPU's gonna go and read stuff out of RAM. And uh, if I have a von Neumann, a true von Neumann type machine, it's gonna have to go to RAM to grab the next instruction, and then go to RAM to grab the data, and then go to RAM again to store the data, and then go to RAM again to, I mean, uh, it, it's more efficient if you can separate out having program memory from instruction, or from data memory, right? So my right. programs, and, and, and this is the common thing, I mean, in, in t today, right, we have these caches, it's kind of amazing to me on x86, because as I'm running along in x86, I can go to the next instruction, and my instruction can overwrite that. And the CPU does the right thing, despite the fact that, I mean, the data write looks like a data write. And, and the instructions have gotten loaded into a completely separate read-only cache. But they have enough circuitry in there to say, like, this write is to something that's in the instruction cache, meaning I gotta invalidate the instruction cache, I gotta invalidate everything dependent on the instruction cache, like these decoded microps, et cetera and then just like flush the pipeline, forget everything we're doing, and go back and get the right answer because the, the instruction we were about to execute just changed. Uh, the instruction was already half executed. Yes, yeah. actually the instruction that probably we had you know, already thought about executing and said, yeah, we can do that, we've already done it, and we have the answer, and we have to say, none of that ever happened, retro, retcon, that whole uh, thing did not exist. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, hardware architecture and uh, there are machines that I've worked on, like the, the PIC microcontroller is, is really uh, wacky because uh, it has 14-bit wide instructions. <laughs> and 14 bits is not a power of two. It's not even an integral number of bytes. It's like, wow, what, why 14 bits? So That's how many they needed to represent all the instructions they, they wanted. If they need 16, that would be a waste. <laughs> <laughs> and all of their instructions were stored in this one little array of flash built into the chip. And that array of flash is 14 bits wide. So it's dedicated program memory that stores instruction. Oh, that's what you could do, 14 bits. Yeah. That would allow you to have yeah. two bits of parity, which would allow it to flip out if something was uh, 
funky with the instructions. Mm, you could, you could, yeah. It, well, so if you wanted to store it on a byte-oriented memory, like every storage device ever, uh, then uh, then that, that would totally be what you, you know, you'd have to figure out something to do with those extra two bits. Well, you, you, you could do whatever you wanted with them. You know, you could ignore them, or like I said, you could make them no, parity bits. Be parity bits. No. That'd be useful for, say, like, say, like a spacecraft type thing. I've seen really ridiculous things with this, uh, where, so for example, I get 14 bits of data, but 16 bits is kind of the obvious, like, you know, storage size. So I would be really tempted to say, store two zeros, not, not that hard. I've seen situations where you'll say, like, well, <clears throat> we got to do 14 bits of data and then two bits of the next instruction. And now we've got 12 bits for the next 16. Mm. And, and then at some point, these things will repeat. So you, you're on like a seven instruction cycle that ends up adding. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not, not pretty. Uh, but so well, if, I, if I'm going to encode the operation of the machine as numbers, I have to figure out how many bits to use for the number. And this is a really hard decision. So, so it's it, 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 there's, there's all of these sorts of alternatives that you got to uh, kind of trade off. I, I feel like the ideal is to have bytes because bytes are you know like the, the smallest addressable unit on most machines. So I can sort of grab eight bits at a time, and eight bits is kind of a good number. I can take two to six possibilities. I don't have enough space in a byte to store any like data. Like if I want to, you know, I, I can say uh, I want to add, I want to subtract, I want to call a function, I want to return from a function, I want to do the floating point. It's the, the you know a couple hundred things to do awful with bytes. But I can't really specify, I mean, a byte doesn't have enough space to say what you're doing it on, generally. Right, so, so, if I, so, so for example, if Johnny uses byte code, so they have no space to indicate which register you want to do stuff on. So they don't. They use no bits to indicate the registers because they have a stack-based machine. Uh, and and this, is, this is a relatively decent way to write an interpreter, uh, but it, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not a great match for the hardware, and it's not a real high-performance uh, kind, of, kind of solution. Uh, but the, it, so, so the big advantage is you don't actually need to store any bits for uh, uh, anything in which register. PIF actually has kind of an easy time because there's only one register, which means you know what register it's operating on, the register. So no, uh, no, no surprises there. Uh, it, you know, everybody wants to have more registers, but the problem is you want you have more registers, you have more bits to store the, you know, indicate which register you want. And uh, these bits are coming right out of your instruction and uh, I don't know, I, I feel like there's kind of there's kind of two main sweet spots, right? One is kind of a byte-oriented instruction set. So Java bytecode in terms of x86 is really super duper byte-oriented in the same way. Uh, so, so with a byte-oriented instruction set, basically I say, so, so for example, uh, Java bytecode, if I want to do a SI push to load a 16-bit constant, so it pushes it onto the, the little uh, operand stack that it uses, then uh, th that 16-bit uh, that push needs the 16 bits to come from somewhere. There's no space inside the 8-bit SI push opcode to store it. So you just have the opcode and then you have the 16 bits of data. Now, the downside is that what, what that means is if, if, if I've got a big array of, you know, i got a program, it's not just instructions. It means it's instructions, then maybe some data, then more instructions, then more data, then more instructions. So th that means if uh, I, don't know, I, uh, I prefetch and I say, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in here and, and I want to know what the instructions are. Well, I kind of I have this sequential bottleneck of having to start at the first byte and then figure out what that is before I can figure out what the next byte is, before I can figure out what the next byte is, or even where the instructions start. So uh, any sort of fixed size instruction machine uh, basically got this sort of accelerated high performance, uh, you know, uh, out of order execution stuff, just, you know, about a decade before any of the variable size machines. Because it's just it's, it's a heck of a lot easier. So ARM, for example, is all 32 bit instructions. So if I want to know what the tenth instruction from now is going to be, so there's no branches in the way, if I just go, you know, 320 bits down, and there it is. Uh, very very simple, uh, much easier to do uh, 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 sort of prediction or computing what is going to happen in the future. X86. This is really I mean some really smart people spend a lot of time figuring out how to do sort of out of order high performance uh, execution of on X86. It, especially considering all of the, the other wacky things that uh, x86 allows. So in x86, it, there are literally instructions on x86 that, that take uh, eight bits. So in, in the old 32-bit one, for example, there was a ink EAX. So it'd be one byte that just says you're going to increment EAX, and 
cool. See, it's something you need to do fairly often. It only takes one byte. Uh, there's one byte that says return from this this uh, this function. Right? I mean, you don't need any parameters for return. You, you it, know, it looks at a it looks at a specific yeah. register and does like three things with it. Yeah. So uh, so uh, th th there's actually a great theorem that I think we have uh, listed somewhere here that a variable size code is always going to be potentially more efficient than a fixed size code. And uh, and and, and their, their really annoyance is actually good. ARM is particularly bad about this. I got 32 bit instructions. There's no way I can have a 32 bit constant. I mean, that, you can just give up on that because then there's no space to say where you're loading it or what else you're doing with it. Uh, so, so ARM only lets you load 8 bit constants in one instruction, right? And it, it, it will let you shift them around. So if I want to load like uh, 1024, I can totally do it. But 1023, I can't load in one step, which seems like it's just not, not enough bits in the instruction to represent that, so that's, that's what you're stuck with. Most of the other kind of fixed size machines, and I feel like MIPS is kind of the first one uh, to get at the uh, Hennessy and Patterson book, uh, really describe MIPS in detail, and uh, this, this feels like kind of the, uh, and I, I, didn't, I didn't list them all here, but uh, MIPS, PowerPC, uh, uh, Sun Palo Alto, RISC, uh, Spark machines that they're still making, uh, uh, Deck Alpha, uh, there were, the PA risk. Uh, so so th th there were a bunch of machines based on 32 bits, uh, 32 bit instructions, 32 registers, which means you burn in five bits per uh, register. And, and and this is actually there's kind of a pretty big mismatch here. Like I can have three operating instructions, you know, and burn, you know, have have, have a you know a good number of registers, 32 registers, quite a lot of registers. Uh, it, it only costs me five bits per uh, register slot. So that means I can do like, uh, you know, I, I can easily say like, you know, destination equals source one plus source two, so you know, three operand adds. Uh, X86 return is old enough that basically it, uh, so, so for example, an add on X86, there's eight bits saying like I'm doing an add. Uh, the next eight bits are called a mod RM byte, and uh, they're trying to cram into eight bits the source register, destination register, whether it's memory to memory, register to register, register to memory, memory to register. Like there's there's a lot of options there, so uh, mod RM byte is only eight bits, so they, they they couldn't do 16 registers. They had to get it, drop it down to like, you know, eight registers. So I got three bits for the source, three bits for the destination, and I still get two bits to say if it's register, 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 memory, memory, memory. And boy, uh, eight registers was kind of marginal when the instruction set first came out, and by the 90s it was like, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Not I, was playing a game. Registers. I was playing a game where you have one register yeah, for yeah. programming. Yeah, it's totally, it's totally doable. <laughs> it, 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 it's, just, it's hard to do high performance uh, code. You, you end up yeah. like shuffling stuff in and out of the register all the time. Well, the game is supposed to be a challenge. It's supposed to be. Is that, uh, what's the name of the game? I've heard of one. Um, I think I bought it actually, but I didn't, didn't actually try it. Let me find it real quick. It's, it's all text based. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's, it's it's like a weird parallel game. Yeah. Oh, Tiz 1000. There we go. Mm. Tiz 100, I should say. There we go. I, I need to play through it and then see if I should assign it as a homework. Uh, show, let's see. Show, show, uh, uh, x86, it doesn't have enough registers. And, and it's got this weird, it's got this weird byte-oriented flavor on x86, right? Where it's got like, I got a byte to say what operation I'm doing and I have maybe more bytes to, so, so uh, XB8, for example, is, says like load a 32 bit constant into uh, EAX. And uh, B8 is followed by the 32 bits you're loading into EAX. Now, they want to make this thing 64 bit. I mean, it's not 64 bit. But uh, the, 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 there was sort of this precedent for x64 that uh, uh, x86 originally was like a, a 16 bit architecture that they extended to 32 bit. So the way they extended to 32 bit was uh, kind of cool because B8 in 16 bit mode meant you were loading something into AX. And you're just loading a you know a two byte constant. But if so, if, if you're in 16 bit mode, that meant uh, uh, B8 loaded a 32 bit constant, uh, a 16 bit constant. If you if you're if you switch to 32 bit mode, that same instruction suddenly means load a different value. So I'm loading more data with the same instruction. Now, if I'm in 32-bit mode, but I want to load a 16-bit constant, I want it to work like it did, they, uh, they have a prefix, which is 66, i.e. 16-bit. So 
prefix byte of 66 says, like, the next thing is going to be short. Sets a flag somewhere in the CPU saying, it's short. It sees a load and says, ah, normally that load would be big, but now it's going to be short. So, uh, so this, this same B8, if I add a, uh, they call it a rex prefix byte, so like a 4.0, uh, the 4 means it's 64-bit. So now I do a B8, so this again just sets a flag somewhere in there, and when I load, this thing is suddenly like an 8-byte load. Does that, does that make sense? So uh, prefix bytes are a way for them, to, and uh, 66, like all, all, they, all they needed was to say it's 16-bit or not. So there's one byte, 66. Uh, for, for the Rex bytes, they, uh, they actually bulldoze the whole, the, the, four, the 4 the row used to be a set of instructions in 32-bit mode, they were increments. Uh, so the, they bulldoze those and they said, they're not increments anymore, 4x, so hex, uh, leading digits 4 meaning 64-bit mode. And now I've just freed up four bits. I can use those four bits anywhere I want. So for example, uh, uh, so what they did with these four bits is uh, uh, I suddenly have space to add an extra bit to like the source register, or destination register, maybe a memory operation. So, so for, for example, a 64-bit x86 add, and, and this is, uh, this is quite depressing. Uh, so we got a hex four, and then we got a, a, a 01 is the opcode for, uh, for, for an add. So uh, first byte is the rex byte, saying it's 64 bit. Uh, I have the extra bits uh, for, the, uh, to, to, uh, for, for which registers I'm adding here, the high, the high bits. Uh, and, and then I have a mod RM byte uh, here, so, so for example, if I do, uh, so uh, I'm going to add RAX to RAX. So for example, it's just going to be mod RM of, uh, gosh, it's not zero. It's uh, C zero. So the C part is a one one, meaning it's a register register operation. And I've got a source and a destination. So these are the three bit values that tell us uh, uh, source register is EAX, destination register is EAX. And if I, if, I, if, I have, if I make this 4 O, that's really EAX, right, zero, zero. But if I make this like 4F, then I can suddenly access this new register, R8. Because it tacks an extra one on at the high end of these. Does that make sense? I agree, it does not make sense. So the source register number has one lonely bit here and uh, three of the bits here. And this whole byte is optional. <laughs> so if you leave this one off, you get the low, you know, the original registers, not the extended registers. Wacky. <sighs> yeah, so that's, that's x86. The, I mean, t t to me, the horror with x86 is that they started in 1972 just trying to get a, this chip out the door. And they kind of just semi-randomly pick some, you know, instruction codings and stuff, and then they upgraded that to be 16-bit for the, you know, the 8086. They well, upgraded back to the 32 code for the 8086. Right. Right. still works. So, so the paradox is like my machine today, its instruction set is like sort of descended from this ancient 4004 calculator. That like, I mean, there's no chance I want to run any software from the 4004 on my my new, you know, uh, core i7. That's crazy. But I want to run code on my i7 from the old Pentium era. And Pentium era code wanted to run stuff from the 46, we want to run stuff from the 386, we want to run stuff from the 8086, we want to run stuff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that transitivity of backward compatibility just kind of ends up getting and tying you into knots. Uh, th th there's an even sadder story. So uh, in the 1990s, this was prior to X64, so AMD was the one that actually came out with the, uh, the, uh, this, this uh, this monstrosity to bolt 64-bit uh, operation and more registers onto x86. Uh, Intel's official version of the 64-bit Intel architecture was called Itanium, uh, presumably intended to sound like titanium, you know, awesome metal. Uh, the, the register, which is kind of a uh, uh, ironic UK uh, tech magazine, called it Itanic, to sound like the uh, Titanic. In other words, this giant doomed architecture that was just going to like hit a uh, iceberg and sink or something. 
So Itanium, the idea was this was going to be a very forward-thinking architecture. Uh, so they wanted to make sure no one would ever make fun of them for not having a registry again. So they put 128 uh, general purpose registers in. And so, so they're burning seven bits for source, destination, you know, uh, other source. So like, uh, the, the other thing they want is they, they want to avoid branching because branching is really expensive. Uh, hopefully you can get to this. Uh, so so the, the, they had a whole array of predicate registers and every instruction can depend on a predicate register. So the idea is if the predicate register is true, the instruction fires. If the predicate register is false, that instruction was like on the else part of a branch you're not taking and the instruction doesn't happen. So uh, 64 predicate registers, which means you're burning more data for the predicate registers. Uh, the interesting part is they blew the 32-bit boundary. So uh, Itanium instructions are 41 bits long, which is not a, not a great number. So they pack them in groups of three. A bundle of three instructions goes into a 16-byte instruction packet, 128 bits. And, and then there's the, you actually gain a few little extra bits to specify like the, uh, the different type and then the, you, could, you could load a 64-bit constant if you used two instruction packet uh, uh, sort of slots for, for this thing. But it, it, it meant that, and, and uh, it was designed to work with, it was designed to execute three instructions at a time. So statically, the program was expected to just realize these three instructions are running simultaneously. So boom, right, so, uh, it, it, so, so uh, the, the original acronym for this was uh, EPIC, the Explicitly Parallel Instructions of Computer, which is a cool idea. Right? That means I, I, will, I will hard code in the program saying, like, I'm going to do this is the integer operation, that's the floating point operation, that's the memory operation, like, because I have all these different parts of the machine that I can fire up uh, at the same time. It's a cool idea. It failed pretty much miserably in the marketplace because, A, I mean, no existing software will run on IT. Right, you have to compile everything for it. And the Linux people are like, sure, we'll do it. And like, so Linux guys are like, yeah, all our stuff runs. It runs fairly slow. It runs slow because uh, compilers don't know how to optimize for 128 registers. That's a lot more registers than anyone else. Compilers really don't know what the hell to make of this whole three, pa three instruction packet thing. Like, like the, the, the estimate was that uh, in 10 or 20 years, we can actually get the compiler to generate reasonable assembly, uh, you, you know, using the three instruction packet in, in a fairly same way. Uh, and uh, until those same 20 years go by, what the compiler usually did was it had uh, an instruction and two no ops. <laughs> Which meant that usually, like, the compiled code was about, I mean, at least Three half the speed or maybe a third of the speed of, like, you know, if somebody had gone through and just handwritten a bunch of assembly to, like, you know, uh, to have these three, uh, three things happen anymore. Now, so, uh, th I actually kind of had an interesting interaction with this. So, late 90s, Intel was trying to sell a bunch of Itaniums to uh, the University of Illinois to build a supercomputer. And the University of Illinois says, well, we got some benchmarks, right, that uh, they run the, uh, the not another molecular dynamics simulator, NAMD. Uh, which is actually used by thousands of people, actually some Nobel Prizes, uh, prize winning like biochemistry has been uh, based on that simulator. And uh, you know, we want NAMD to run fast, around a couple other applications uh, to run fast. And NAMD ran like crap, because the compiler just, you know, the compiler's not good at, uh, at doing that. And, uh, and this is kind of like, kind of looks like we're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna be buying Itanium for the supercomputer. And Intel says, oh, on the Intel compiler, you should use dash O NAMD. And we're like, dash O NAMD. <laughs> like, that, that really wasn't there in the previous rev of the compiler, but it's here now. So try dash O NAMD. Performance is awesome. I mean, it's just like beautiful, perfect. And uh, you, you go and look at the disassembly, and basically it's like crap, crap, crap disassembly for the file I.O. and all the other crap in NAMD. And then it hit the inner loop of NAMD, and it's just like, whoa. You know, beautiful, like, you know, there are no no ops, right? And, it, and in fact, it's, it's basically organized so that the data is coming out of the pipeline right at the moment it needs to get fit in the next one. It's just, it's beautiful. Some, some really smart person spent a ton of time hand optimizing the assembly for the inner loop of NAMD. They took that hand optimized inner loop, and if you pass dash O NAMD, it says, ah, it's NAMD then? Boop. <laughs> It's out the uh, the appropriate now, now. The problem, of course, is that we you know we we said like that's that's weird. I wonder if we change the inner loop of NAMD. You change the inner loop of NAMD, and it you know the hand for assembly doesn't work anymore, so it just spits out a bunch of crap. Which, how do you feel about that? We had really mixed feelings about that. 
Because they estimated that like uh, half the workload of this machine was going to be NAMD. And it would run NAMD great as long as no one touched the inner loop of NAMD. <laughs> of course, you know, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't change the inner loop of NAMD because we didn't actually have a compiler. What we had was a very, you know, uh, very well disguised guide Intel that was writing assembly for us. How dishonest is it to have dash O of NAMD in your compiler? What is that? Is it bad? Is it bad? It's not so money. Because if you ever want to change it, you can this one. So we kind of had this discussion like, are we likely to want to change it? Because like the inner loop is like computing molecular forces. And like, probably not. Adam's or Adam. We, don't, we didn't really foresee. In any any way we would, I, I think we ended up buying some, but uh, the, the fact that you basically had to get Intel to write you some code to get good performance out of any given application seemed suboptimal. I guess it was similar to like the you know I was going to plug the control panel in for, for the new thing. So in, in the marketplace I came, as far as I could tell, just died in the death, which not not many were unhappy with that outside of Intel. So that uh, that that certainly happened. Uh, interesting thing Itanium does and ARM does is that uh, the, uh, instructions are predicatable. And, and this is actually not there in most instruction sets. So, uh, so, so uh, our ARM has a pretty straightforward way of doing it that uh, every time I do a compare or something sets condition flags. Most machines then have like a branch that depends on the condition flags. Uh, ARM, every instruction can depend on the condition flags, right? So, so if I have like a jump if greater than or equal, if it's greater than or equal, it jumps. Uh, ARM lets you do an add if greater than or equal, a divide if greater than or equal, right? Uh, and which means if it's greater than or equal, it adds. So you actually have two different ways to encode like an if statement in ARM, right? So I go and I do the compare, and then on a normal machine, I would just jump over the body if the compare comes out false. Uh, on ARM, you can just set every instruction in the body to be predicated, and no jumps at all. No jumps is really good because jumps jumps kind of destroy a bunch of the you know, prefetching stuff that modern machines do. If you can avoid jumps, then you need you know less branch prediction, less uh, uh, you know uh, opportunities for uh, performance problems or security problems as we've we seen recently. So predication, totally an option. Uh, now uh, the, the you might still want to do a jump, and that's if it's really big or if it's calling a function. jumping off somewhere else, then you, you know, skip over the whole thing if, uh, if, if you don't want to do it. Uh, the compiler, actually, Intel has like a conditional move and a conditional set. So like a C move GE or a set GE. You know, so, uh, so, so set rates a one or a zero, depending on if it's you know, like, uh, compared to not true or false. Compiler loves using those because those avoid branches that improve performance of uh, unpredictable code. The one I didn't put in here was uh, uh, Motorola 68000 that I think has totally died out. Uh, now my, my hazy recollection on Motorola 68000 was that 16-bit uh, wide instruction. It feels like good entry in this table, but maybe so. Uh, it had two operands, uh, just like x86. I, I believe there were 16 total registers or eight address and eight data registers. I have no recollection of what immediate Data. I mean, it's had to be pretty small, I guess, to cram to a 16-bit instruction. And they, they didn't do anything fancy with the, uh, uh, the, the branching. Actually, the pick, pick, and, uh, believe it or not, I've written, I've written assembly for like money, I think, for all of these. Uh, uh, let's see, skip next instruction if condition is true. I've never seen any other machine that does branching like that. So, so uh, uh, picks, conditional execution says, uh, if if it's if something or other is true, skip the next instruction. And typically, the next instruction would be like a jump. Uh, that, that's the way to make it a conditional branch. But you can actually do like army stuff if you say like skip the next instruction if it's true, and then you have an add. You just you just have to make your your instruction false, or your your condi you know your conditional evaluate to false. Uh. I can see the I can see the thought behind skipping the next instruction with the jump, yeah. but it takes it took a special mind to think of that. Yeah, I, I, I like that. I like that notion. Uh, MIPS has a thing called the branch delay slot, 
so, so this is true of a lot of machines that like when they're executing instruction I, they're actually already loaded and they're kind of thinking about and like ready or maybe halfway through running instruction I plus one. So the problem is if instruction I is a branch, I plus one never happens, right? So it kind of a, like, so the machine has to, it has to either predict branches or it has to like undo work it's done. Uh, the branch delay slot on MIPS says, if I is a branch, I plus one runs anyway. This is part of the definition of kind of the machine architecture. Like, uh, you branch, you're, you're gone, but you're going to do one thing first. Oops, I will. Pop. Questions? So, for, for the, the, so the reason I'm talking about this now, for the homework, you have to design an instruction set. So you have to pick a number of registers or no registers at all. You have to pick an instruction set. And th there's a lot of options. It's a surprisingly subtle, complex choice to make. Ha have, have, you also, have you heard the, the homework? Did I? Yeah. Yeah. I was looking at it. You, you, you. Cool. Okay. Uh, I will see you on Monday. We will start at noon for some reason. Wait. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, we, 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 need, we need the fourth hour. hour. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So we are in class for, uh, let's see, your CS. So it's called. Okay. So we're just